Chapter number seventeen of the story of eclipses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, BC. The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers catalogues of eclipses and their calculation this must of necessity be a brief chapter so far as mere lines of text are concerned but it will not on that account be unimportant it will be evident to the reader that many more eclipses of interest have happened and will happen than it has been possible to speak of in these pages accordingly as it is one of the main objects of this series of volumes to create a thirst for knowledge to be satisfied by the study of other and bigger volumes it will be desirable to furnish a list of some of the various books and publications in which eclipses will be found catalogued or described in detail so that readers desirous of pursuing the matter further may possess facilities for doing so by far the most complete and comprehensive catalogue of solar eclipses is that prepared some years ago by austrian astronomer the late theodore von oppelser of vienna and published under the title of canon der finisteres in the memoirs of the imperial academy of sciences this work supplies approximate calculations of about eight thousand eclipses of the sun for a period of more than three thousand years from november tenth twelve o seven b c julian calendar to november seventeenth two thousand one hundred and sixty one a d gregorian calendar there are appended a hundred and sixty charts of all the principal eclipses but as the charts only exhibit the beginnings middles and ends of the eclipses dealt with they are frequently misleading because the intermediate lines of path are in many cases more or less considerably curved another very important and comprehensive catalogue of eclipses solar and lunar together will be found in the well-known french work Le art de verifier de dates compiled by a member of the religious order of st mar one volume of this famous work contains eclipses from the year one thousand and one b c to the christian era whilst another volume gives a similar catalogue from the year one a d to two thousand a d the other volumes deal with chronological matters only although not strictly a work of extreme astronomical exactness yet la art de verifier de dates stands unrivalled as a record not only to subversive the purpose indicated by its title but of the bare facts of the eclipses which have happened during the period of three thousand years stated above there has not been much done in england in the way of publishing eclipse records or tables past or future but in the british almanac and companion for eighteen thirty two there is given a catalogue which was useful in its day of eclipses then future from eighteen thirty two to nineteen hundred omitting however solar eclipses hardly visible to any inhabited portion of the earth and lunar eclipses where the part of the moon's diameter obscured was less than one twelfth in bygone days several attempts were made to gather together in a tabular or paragraph form the details of eclipses which had happened and some of these have been important sources of information for the guidance of us moderns foremost amongst these efforts must be named the algamistium novum by j b Ricolus. this work contains a catalogue of eclipses observed from seventeen seventy two b c to a d sixteen forty seven 
and continued in tables to A.D. 1700. It is prefaced, page 286 to 8, by a long series of quotations from classical authors relating to eclipses, some few of which have already been mentioned in these pages. Kepler paid much attention to eclipses, and left behind him a large mass of notes and original observations. These will be found chiefly in his Astronomy Par Optica, Chapter 7, Paragraph 2, originally published at Frankfurt in 1604. The most convenient and accessible edition of this is to be found in Frisch's reprint of all Kepler works. Tycho Bra also gathered together from various sources many observations of eclipses, and combined them with a number of his own, the whole being published in his Historia Solistis. Tycho Brahe was a very interesting personage, in spite of the fact that he went all astray on the subject of the system of the universe, and he well deserves what has been given to him, a book, all to himself. It is peculiarly appropriate that I should give him a good word in this little volume on eclipses, because it was the solar eclipse of August 21st, 1560, which first seriously led him to take up astronomical pursuits, he being then 14 years of age, and struck with wonder that eclipses could be predicted. A vast amount of historical and other information respecting eclipses will be found in a book, the Latinized name of whose author is Cepheus Calvinist. The title of the work is Opus Chronologium. The historical matter is very much mixed, but the eclipses can be got a hold of through the index, which is very full. P. Gassendi, a well-known astronomer of the 17th century, left behind him observations of many eclipses, observed by himself between 1628 and 1655. In a book entitled An Introduction to the Universal Geography, one Nicholas Stryuk, in the middle of the 18th century, published a very full array of eclipse observations collected with infinite pains from an endless variety of authors, ancient and modern. In 1757, the well-known James Ferguson reprinted his astronomy, but in a very condensed form. All Stryuk's eclipses from 721 B.C. to A.D. 1485. Then he carried on his catalogue to 1800, by means of the materials furnished by Riccolus and the art de verifier de dates. Ferguson also invented a machine for illustrating mechanically the circumferences of an eclipse. He called it the Eclipse Ceron. A full description is given in his book, mentioned above, but I do not know whether any such instrument is still in existence or, if so, where it is to be found. Ferguson apologizes for the incompleteness of his eclipse information in the following words. I have not cited one half of Riccolus's list of portentous eclipses, and for the same reason that he declines giving any more of them than what that list contains, namely, that tis most disagreeable to dwell any longer on such nonsense, and as much as possible to avoid tiring the reader. The superstition of the ancients may be seen by the few here copied. My author further says that there were treaties written to show against what regions the malevolent effects of any particular eclipse was aimed and the writers affirmed that the effects of an eclipse of the sun continued as many years as the eclipse lasted hours, and that of the moon as many months. The most comprehensive, indeed almost the only, 
modern English book on eclipses is the Reverend S. G. Johnson's, of which frequently use has already been made in these pages. It contains a vast amount of matter put together in a condensed form, but the references to authorities are rather defective and deficient. Less comprehensive in one sense, yet exceedingly valuable and interesting as a succinct summary of solar eclipse knowledge up to the date of 1896, is Mrs. D. P. Todd's excellent little volume, which has been several times quoted on previous pages. On various occasions in 1890 and following years, Professor J. N. Stockwell contributed to the American Astronomical Journal a number of papers, discussing in a very interesting and exhaustive manner many of the eclipses recorded by the ancient classical authors. These papers should be consulted by all who desire to realize the value of eclipse records in connection with mundane chronology. The calculation of eclipses is a matter of some interest. It is beyond the scope of the present work to explain even in outline the methods in use, but with the aid of the books mentioned below, a reader possessed of the necessary time, mathematical knowledge, and patience will be able to pursue this matter as far as his inclination may lead him. Johnson has found very useful the tables given in the eighth edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica article Astronomy, but strange to say these tables do not appear in ninth edition of that famous work. Lalande has given numerous references to eclipse of the sun during the 16th, 17th, and 18th centuries, which may be useful to those who wish to work at the history of eclipses. End of chapter 17. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Chapter 18 of the Story of Eclipses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers. Chapter 18 Strange Eclipse Customs. I had intended heading this chapter Eclipse Customs Amongst Barbarous Nations, but in these days it is dangerous to talk of barbarians or to speak one's mind on points of social etiquette, so I have thought it well to tone down the original title. Otherwise, I should have the partisans of the heathen Chinese holding me up to scorn as a reviler of the brethren. Did space permit, a very interesting record might be furnished of eclipse customs in foreign parts. An eclipse happened during Lord Macartney's embassy to China, which kept the emperor and his mandarins for a whole day devoutly praying the gods that the moon might not be eaten up by the great dragon which was hovering about her. The next day a pantomime was performed, exhibiting the battle of the dragon and the moon, and in which two or three hundred priests, bearing lanterns at the end of long sticks, dancing and capering about, sometimes over the plain, and then over chairs and tables, bore no mean part. Professor Russell, who is quoted elsewhere in this book with respect to Chinese eclipses, makes the following remarks in regard to what happens now in China when eclipses occur. It will be interesting here to note that even at present, by imperial command, special rites are performed during solar and lunar eclipses. A president from each of the six boards, with two inferior officials dressed in their official clothes, proceed to the Tai Chung Su. When the eclipse begins, they change their robes for common garments made of plain black material, 
and kneeling down burn incense the president then beats one stroke on a gong and the ceremony is taken up by all the attendant officials a writer in chambers journal in an article entitled the hindu view of the late eclipse gives an interesting and original account of diverse hindu superstitions and ceremonies which came under his notice in connection with the total eclipse of the sun of august eighteenth eighteen sixty eight he remarks that european science has as yet produced but little effect upon the minds of the superstitious masses of india of the many millions who witnessed the eclipse of the eighteenth of august last there were comparatively few who did not verily believe that it was caused by the dragon rahu in his endeavour to swallow up the lord of day the pious hindu before the eclipse comes on takes a torch and begins to search his house and carefully removes all cooked food and all water for drinking purposes such food and water by the eclipse incur grahana sesha that is uncleanness and are rendered unfit for use some with less scruples of conscience declare that the food may be preserved by placing on it daba or kusa grass and much more to the like effect is duly set out in the interesting article cited during the total eclipse of the sun of august seventh eighteen sixty nine the following incident is noted to have occurred at a station on the chikalt river in alaska north america frequented by indians about the time the sun was half obscured the chief Ko Klux and all the indians had disappeared from around the observing tent they left off fishing on the river banks all employments were discontinued and every soul disappeared nor was a sound heard throughout the village of fifty-three houses the natives had been warned of what would take place but doubted the prediction when it did occur they looked upon me as the cause of the sun's being very sick and going to bed they were thoroughly alarmed and overwhelmed with an undefinable dread a still more thrilling incident is thus recorded of the eclipse of july twenty ninth eighteen seventy eight by a witness at fort sill indian territory u s on monday last we were permitted to see the eclipse of the sun in a beautiful bright sky not a cloud was visible we had made ample preparation laying in a stock of smoked glass several days in advance it was the grandest sight i ever beheld but it frightened the indians badly some of them threw themselves upon their knees and invoked the divine blessing others flung themselves flat on the ground face downward others cried and yelled in frantic excitement and terror finally one old fellow stepped from the door of his lodge pistol in hand and fixing his eyes on the darkened sun mumbled a few unintelligible words and raising his arm took direct aim at the luminary fired off his pistol and after throwing his arms about his head in a series of extraordinary gesticulations retreated to his own quarters as it happened that very instant was the conclusion of totality the indians beheld the glorious orb of day once more peep forth and it was unanimously voted that the timely discharge of that pistol was the only thing that drove away the shadow and saved them from the public inconvenience that would have certainly resulted from the entire extinction of the sun a certain m f kerrigan in a book published in eighteen forty four made the following remarks on ancient jewish ideas respecting eclipses 
the israelites like their benighted neighbours esteemed an eclipse of either luminary as a supernatural and inauspicious omen which filled them with the most gloomy and fearful apprehensions as may fairly be deduced from the eighth chapter of ezekiel verse fifteen then he brought me to the door of the lord's house which was towards the north and behold there sat women weeping for tammuz now tammuz is the name under which adonis was known in palestine he was the favourite of venus or astarte the principal goddess of the philistines and phoenicians being killed by a wild boar the prevailing superstition of the age induced the uninformed multitude to believe that when the moon was eclipsed it was in compliment to their beloved goddess venus or astarte who concealed behind the full moon sat weeping under a dark veil for the loss of her beloved tammuz or adonis the african travellers r and j lander have given a graphic account of what took place on the occasion of the eclipse of the moon of september second eighteen thirty as witnessed by themselves the earlier part of the evening had been mild serene and remarkably pleasant the moon had arisen with uncommon lustre and being at the full her appearance was extremely delightful it was the conclusion of the holidays and many of the people were enjoying the delicious coolness of a serene night and resting from the laborious exertions of the day but when the moon became gradually obscured fear overcame every one as the eclipse increased they became more terrified all ran in great distress to inform their sovereign of the circumstance for there was not a single cloud to cause so deep a shadow and they could not comprehend the nature or meaning of an eclipse groups of men were blowing on trumpets which produced a harsh and discordant sound some were employed in beating old drums others again were blowing on bullocks horns the diminished light when the eclipse was complete was just sufficient for us to distinguish the various groups of people and contributed in no small degree to render the scene more imposing if a european a stranger to africa had been placed on a sudden in the midst of the terror-struck people he would have imagined himself to be among a legion of demons holding a revel over a fallen spirit. End of chapter eighteen. Recording by Linda Olson Fytak, Los Angeles. Chapter nineteen of the Story of Eclipses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. THE STORY OF ECLIPSES BY GEORGE CHAMBERS CHAPTER Nineteen, ECLIPSES IN SHAKESPEARE AND THE POETS The sound of these words may be large, but facts do not bear out the theory, for eclipses do not appear to have captivated our great poets to anything like the extent that moon, stars, and comets have done. Shakespeare has a few allusions to eclipses, but they are not of prime importance. In Macbeth we find and slips of you shivered in the moon's eclipse act four scene one the precise meaning of which is not very obvious shivered of course means divided into pieces but the idea intended is obscure the next quotation is more comprehensive and reflects more plainly the current of thought prevalent in shakespeare's day albeit here again the word eclipse will be found to stand without much definite connection with what goes before However, the reader shall judge for himself. As stars with trains of fire and dews of blood, disasters in the sun, and the moist star upon whose influence Neptune's empire stands, was sick almost to doomsday with eclipse. Hamlet, Act I, Scene I. In King Lear we seem to come upon something very definitely historical, but I am not able to say what it is. 
the Earl of Gloucester says, These late eclipses in the sun and moon portend no good to us. With this, Edmund, Gloucester's son, apparently agrees, for he exclaims, These eclipses do portend these divisions. Act One, Scene Two. In Othello, the Moor of Venice himself, in a moment of excitement, says, O oh, insupportable, O oh, heavy hour, methinks it should be now a huge eclipse of sun and moon, and that the affrighted globe should yawn at alteration. Act Five, Scene Two. In Antony and Cleopatra we find Anthony expressing what our forefathers so often thought in connection with astronomical matters. Alack! Our terrine moon is now eclipsed, and it portends alone the fall of Anthony. Act Three, Scene Eleven. Milton has an allusion to an eclipse of the sun, which possesses a twofold interest, intrinsic and extrinsic. The former feature will be self-evident when the passage is read. The poet, in describing the faded splendor of the fallen archangel, compares him to the sun seen under circumstances which have temporarily deprived it of its normal brilliancy and glory. As when the sun new risen looks through the horizontal misty air, shorn of his beams, or from behind the moon in dim eclipse, disastrous twilight sheds on half the nations, and with fear of change perplexes monarchs. It has been well said by Dr. Orchard that this passage affords us an example of the sublimity of Milton's imagination, and of his skill in adapting the grandest phenomena of nature to the illustration of his subject. What I alluded to in saying that extrinsic interest attached to this quotation is the fact that these lines might have caused the suppression of the poem as a whole. Mrs. Todd puts the matter thus, Paradise Lost was begun probably in 1658, although not finished until 1663, nor its thorough revision completed until 1665. The censorship still existed, and Tomkins, one of the chaplains through whom the archbishop gave or refused license, although a broad-minded man than many of his day, found this passage especially objectionable. The poem was allowed to see the light only through the interposition of a friend of Milton, Upon such slender chances may hang the life of an incomparable work of art. But it is easy to see that in the turbulent days when Charles the Second had returned to power, after the death of Cromwell, these lines should have been deemed dangerously suggestive, in imputing to monarchs perplexity and fear of change. Other allusions to eclipses by Milton will be found as follows. Through the air she comes— lured with a smell of infant blood, to dance with Lapland witches, while the laboring moon eclipses at their charms. Paradise Lost, Book Two, Lines 663-666. through 666. So saying, he dismissed them, they with speed their course through thickest constellation held. Spreading their bane, the blasted stars looked wan, and planets planet struck real eclipse, then suffered. Paradise Lost, Book 10, Lines 410 to 414. O oh, dark, 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 amid the blaze of noon, irrevocably dark, total eclipse, without all hope of day. Samson Agonistes, Lines 80 through 82. It was that fatal and perfidious bark, built in the eclipse and rigged with curses dark, that sunk so low that sacred heart of thine. Lysidius, lines 100 to 102. Pope, in the following lines, may be presumed to mean that the covering up of the sun by the moon during a total eclipse results in the moon becoming visible at the cost of the sun's disappearance. For envied wit, like soul eclipsed, makes known the posing body's grossness, not its own. Essay on Criticism, lines 469 through 470. I have not attempted to pursue this matter through the pages of our modern poets, but it is not unlikely that Scott and Tennyson, especially, would have something on the subject of eclipses. End of chapter 19、chapter、20 of the Story of Eclipses This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amelia Chesley. The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers. Chapter 20. Brief Hints to Observers of Eclipses of the Sun. A few words, they must be few for lack of space, may usefully be added by way of advice to persons proposing to choose a suitable locality at which to station themselves for viewing a total eclipse of the sun. To begin with, of course they ought to get as close as possible to the central line, say within ten or twenty miles at the most. This matter settled, the next important point is to find out where the duration of the totality will be longest, coupled with the sun at its maximum elevation above the horizon, to escape the influence of mists and fogs. No advice, properly so called, can be given on these points, because they depend on the special circumstances of every eclipse, and must be ascertained ad hoc from the nautical almanac. In anticipation of a forthcoming eclipse, it is very important to know beforehand the probabilities of weather. If the locus in quo of an expected eclipse is in a civilized country, there will generally not be much difficulty in obtaining a certain amount of information as to this six or twelve months in advance. But inasmuch as total eclipses of the sun, and often the best of them, are visible only in uncivilized countries, or over trackless wastes, the problem becomes a complicated and anxious one. In such cases it is exceedingly desirable where competent observers, including money, are available, that preliminary notes of weather should be made for a year or even two years in advance. There is, in one sense, no difficulty as to this, for all the mathematical local elements of every eclipse are always made public three or four years in advance through the pages of books like the Nautical Almanac, the Connaissance des Temps, the Berliner Jahrbuch, etc. One difficulty always confronts every eclipse expedition. If an out-of-the-way part of the world has to be visited, accessible by sea, transport from England, say, to the foreign shore, is not usually a matter of difficulty, because government ships are often placed at the disposal of astronomers. But the gravest difficulties often have to be faced after the arrival at the foreign shore, and for this reason, every sea coast is, as a general rule applicable to the whole world, bad for astronomical observations. The problem, then, which has to be solved, is how best to get away from the coast inland to a high hill, and to find the means of transporting thither heavy packing cases of instruments, personal luggage, creature comforts, and, if needs be, tents and other accessories of camp life. Let not the reader of either sex take fright at the idea of sleeping under a tent. I speak with considerable experience when I say that, given fine or fairly fine weather, nothing is more enjoyable in a temperate climate. Under the term creature comforts, I mean such things as tinned soups, and preserved provisions which nowadays can so easily be purchased everywhere in England, and of such good quality. I would recommend these being taken even when the eclipse traveller expects to be lodged in the dwelling places of civilized nations. Of course, if in order to see his eclipse he has to go into the wilds of America, Asia, or Africa, he must start fully equipped with all those personal impedimenta which will be found scheduled in the books mentioned in the footnote. Footnote. The Tourist's Pocket Book. F. Galton's Art of Travel. Royal Geographical Society's Hints to Travelers. Etc. End of footnote. End of chapter 20. Chapter 21 of The Story of Eclipses. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers. Transits and Occultations. No book professing to deal with eclipses would be complete without a few words of mention of transits and occultations. A transit is the passing of a primary planet across the sun, or of a secondary planet, i.e. satellite, across its primary, 
whilst an occultation is the concealment of a star by the moon or of a secondary planet i e satellite by its primary a little thought given to this definition will make it clear that a transit is essentially the same in principle as an eclipse of the sun by the moon one body comes in front of another and the former conceals in succession parts of the latter practically the word transit in this connection is more especially applied to passages of the inferior planets mercury and venus across the sun or of the satellites of jupiter across the disk of jupiter whilst the word occultation more particularly calls to mind the concealment of a star apparently a little body by the moon apparently a big body or of a satellite of jupiter a little body by jupiter a big body the star and the satellite in each respective case passing behind the oculating body and being concealed for a shorter or longer time commonly the occulted body will remain hidden for an hour or two more or less in the case of jupiter the satellites of that planet may also on occasions be seen to undergo eclipse in the shadow cast by jupiter itself an eclipse of a jovian satellite is therefore on all fours in principle the same as an eclipse of the moon caused as we know by the moon passing for a short time into the dark shadow cast by the earth the conditions just laid down in respect of jupiter and its satellites also find a counterpart in the case of the satellites of saturn but whilst these phenomena are incessantly occurring and visible in the case of jupiter they are exceedingly rare in the case of saturn owing to its greater distance and the difficulty of seeing most of its satellites because of their small apparent size having regard to the circumstance that transits of mercury and venus only happen at intervals of many years it is not worth while for the purpose of this work to devote any great amount of space to them in point of fact while the next three transits of mercury are as remote as nineteen o seven nineteen fourteen and nineteen twenty four there will be no transit of venus at all during the twentieth century not another indeed until a d two thousand and four from the standpoint of an amateur astronomer the various phenomena which attend the movements of the satellites of jupiter constitute an endless variety of interesting scenes which are the most deserving of attention in that they can be followed with the aid of a telescope of very moderate size and capabilities occultations of planets and stars by the moon may also be recommended to the notice of the owners of small telescopes as events which are constantly happening and which may be readily observed the moon being rapidly in motion it will happen in point of fact that stars are occulted by it one may say every day but of course the moon's light entirely blocks out the smaller stars and only those as large as say about the fifth magnitude are as a rule worth trying to see in this connection a table of the occultations of such stars copied from the nautical almanac will be found in such almanacs as whitaker's and the british if such a table is consulted it will be found that never does a lunation pass without a few stars being noted as undergoing occultation and now and then a planet an occultation of a planet is obviously still more interesting than that of a star from the epoch of a new to full moon the moon moves with its dark edge foremost from the epoch of full to new with its illuminated edge foremost during therefore the first half of a lunation 
the objects occulted disappear at the dark edge and reappear at the illuminated edge during the second half of a lunation things are vice versa the most interesting time for watching occultations is with a young moon no more than say from two to six days old because under such circumstances the star occulted is suddenly extinguished at a point in the sky where there seems nothing to interfere with it end of chapter twenty one recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c appendix to the story of eclipses this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the story of eclipses by george chambers appendix the total eclipse of the sun of may twenty eighth nineteen hundred this appendix deals solely with geographical and transport matters as to which accurate information is not easily obtainable the european locus in quo of the eclipse being in the benighted and somewhat untravelled countries of portugal and spain the intending eclipse excursionist must first make his choice between practically a journey of all sea or of all land the several sea routes are one and all very much cheaper than any possible land journey and almost as quick in point of time with the minimum amount of personal knocking about but some persons will say sea is sea and so it is on the other hand the land journey is exceedingly expensive and beyond france the trains are very incommodious as regards hours speed and connections moreover there being more frontiers than one to cross there are extra opportunities for custom-house squabbles and spain especially is famous for this sort of thing as the eclipse shadow will strike europe in portugal and quit europe in spain the intending traveller must first decide for himself whether he will prefer to go to portugal or spain this settled he will have the choice of several sea routes and in particular of two land routes but before considering these further it will be well to state what are the chief of the various places which are available as observing stations for mixed travelling parties of ladies and gentlemen who have no desire to rough it in out-of-the-way parts of the country the line of central eclipse passes across the peninsula diagonally from northwest to southeast it enters portugal on the coast not far from oporto in latitude forty degrees fifty minutes north longitude eight degrees thirty eight minutes west of greenwich it quits spain on the coast at cape santa pola not far from alicante in latitude thirty eight degrees thirteen minutes north longitude zero degrees thirty minutes west at ovar in portugal population eleven thousand twenty three miles south of oporto the duration of the total phase will be one minute thirty three and a half seconds and the sun's altitude at totality will be forty two degrees at talavera de la reina in spain population nine thousand seven hundred the duration will be one minute twenty seven and a half seconds and the altitude thirty nine degrees whilst at alicante population forty thousand the duration will be still less one minute nineteen seconds and the sun's altitude only thirty four degrees the three towns of ovar talavera and alicante are selected nautical almanac eclipse stations for which special calculations have been made hotel accommodation may be had at all the foregoing places oporto ovar talavera and alicante as will be stated later on but the hotels at Ovar and Talavera are not of much account. Other towns more or less handy for the central line are few in number, and as a rule deficient in lodging accommodation conforming to the English standard. Amongst such possible alternative places the following may be named in order of position from northwest to southeast as accessible by railway. Vijou, population 7,000, hotels Mobilia, Cadite, on a branch of the Beira Alta Railway, 31 miles from Santa Coma Dao Junction, which itself is 88 miles from Oporto. Mangualde, population 3,000, on the Beira Alta Railway, 115 miles from Oporto, and 49 miles from Pampiloza Junction. Placentia, 
population 6,000, hotel Father de Eusebio Sierra, six miles north of the station of that name on the Lisbon and Madrid Railway, Neville Morale, population 3,300, buffet, a station on the Lisbon and Madrid Railway about eight miles west of the central line of eclipse, Erda, a small station on the Madrid and Ciudad Real Railway, crossed by the central line. The nearest accommodation would seem to be at Ciudad Real. Population 14,000. Hotel Baltazar Garcia. 33 miles to the south. Alcazar de San Juan Junction. Population 8,400. Good Buffet. Hotel Casa Briseño. Alcazar is 92 miles south of Madrid. The central line crosses the railway about 15 miles to the south of the town. Tobara, population 7,500. A station on the Chinchilla and Cartagena Railway, 212 miles south of Madrid and 115 miles north of Cartagena, lies about 6 miles south of the central line. Novelda, population 8,000, a station on the Alicante and Madrid Railway, in a beautiful valley about 20 miles north of Alicante. In addition to the above places, it must not be forgotten that both Oporto at one end of the zone of totality and Alicante at the other are within the track of the shadow, but the question of the meteorological conditions of the atmosphere at these places, on the seaboard as they virtually are, has to be considered. A traveler from England to Portugal or Spain by sea has the following choice of routes. 1. Southampton to Oporto fortnightly on Fridays by the steamers of the Royal Mail Steam Packet Company. Fare first class return about eleven pounds. Time about fifty four hours. The return tickets are conveniently grouped in various ways. For example, Southampton to Oporto and back from Vigo or Lisbon, or Southampton to Lisbon and back or back from Vigo but not back from Oporto. Where the booking is to Vigo or Lisbon, of course, the local railway fares have to be paid in addition. Lisbon is 209 miles south of Oporto, Vigo 110 miles north of Oporto. One objection to making any use of Vigo is the extra custom house formalities which have to be gone through on the frontier, and Spanish custom house officials are specially objectionable. 2. Liverpool to Coruna, Carril, Vigo and Oporto fortnightly on Thursdays by the steamers of the Pacific Steam Navigation Company. Fares to the Spanish ports, first class single, six pounds ten shillings, return nine pounds fifteen shillings, second class single, four pounds. To the Portuguese ports, first class single, eight pounds, return twelve pounds, second class single, five pounds, time about four to five days. This does not mean that the steamers are very slow, but they call also at La Rochelle in France. 3. London, Iron Gate Wharf to Oporto at intervals of three weeks on Thursdays by the steamers of the General Steam Navigation Company. Fares, first class single, four pounds, no return tickets issued, no second class. The steamers of this line are inferior to all the others. 4. London. Tilbury to Gibraltar, weekly on Thursdays by the P&O steamers. Fares, first class single, ten pounds, return sixteen pounds. Time, four to five days. London, Tilbury, and Plymouth to Gibraltar, fortnightly on Fridays by the steamers of the Orient Company. Fares and time the same as the P&O. Travelers journeying to Oporto from England will probably not attempt to do any more local sightseeing than what can be readily accomplished by simple railway trips in Portugal to or from Lisbon, but travelers landing at Gibraltar will have it within their power to visit some of the important towns of southern Spain, such as Granada, Seville, Cordova, Toledo, Cadiz, Malaga, etc., an eclipse excursionist who finds himself at Gibraltar and who wishes to avoid as much as possible land traveling in Spain by going on to Alicante and stationing himself in that neighborhood must take shipping locally at Gibraltar. There are Spanish steamer services from Gibraltar and Malaga to Alicante. An overland traveler to Spain, it is presumed that none such will go as far as Portugal, 
has the choice of two routes to eclipse stations in Spain, both starting from Paris. One via Bordeaux, Hendai, Vitoria, Burgos, and Medina del Campo, to Madrid, and thence either west to Talavera, 84 miles from Madrid, or south towards Alcazar de San Juan, 92 miles from Madrid. 2. Via Leon, Perpignan, Barcelona, and Valencia to Alicante. The character of the train service on the second of these routes is almost prohibitive, so that it is almost a question of via Madrid or not at all. The foregoing paragraphs will furnish the reader with an outline of the whole problem of how to reach from England a suitable eclipse station in the peninsula. This outline will pave the way for further details as to land journeys which will be exhibited somewhat in the order of relative complexity and expense, beginning with the simplest. Vigo to Oporto Chief Stations and Distances from Vigo Redondela, 8 miles Guillory Junction, 24 miles Tui, 26 miles Viana, 57 miles Famalicao Junction, 88 miles Oporto, 108 miles Vigo Population 17,000, Hotel Continental, is an important commercial center with fine scenery all around. Redondela is one of the prettiest towns in Spain, especially as viewed from the railway viaducts. At Guillory, carriages may have to be changed for Tui, the last station in Spain, in a custom house. There is a fine cathedral at Tui. The boundary is formed by the river Mino, spanned by a magnificent bridge 400 yards long, railway above and carriage road underneath. Crossing it, the train enters the Portuguese town of Valencia, where there is a strong fortress and a custom house. Viana, population 7,000, Hotel Central. The river Lima is here spanned by a double bridge, rail and road, 700 feet long. From Famalicao there is a loop line to Oporto running round the coast and 15 miles longer than the main line. Ermazende is the junction with the Spanish line to Barca de Alva, Salamanca, and France. Oporto to Ovar in Lisbon. From Oporto to Lisbon by the direct line it is 211 miles. Fares first single, one pound eleven shillings, second single, one pound three shillings. But forwards from Pampeloza, 66 miles, there is a loop line to Lisbon running along the coast and 25 miles longer than the direct line. If it is proposed to visit some of the sites which will be mentioned presently, the coastline must be taken. Chief stations between Oporto and Lisbon by the coastline, Ovar 23 miles, Pampeloza Junction 66 miles, Figueria de Foz 92 miles, Leiria 132 miles, Torres Vedras 192 miles, Lisbon, Rocchio Station, 236 miles. Oporto. Population 120,000. Hotels, Grand Hotel de Oporto, Hotel de Paris, is a busy commercial city with much English coloring. For example, church, hospital, doctor, club, and full modern facilities for locomotion by tramways, cabs, and excursion carriages. The chief sites are 1. Cathedral, 2. Bishop's Palace, 3. Church of St. Francisco, 4. Palacio de Bolsa, 5. Museo Portuense, 6. Museo Industrial, 7. Crystal Palace and Gardens, 8. Bridge of Don Luis I, and 9. Convent, immortalized by Wellington in 1809 when he made his celebrated Passage of the Douro. The port for Oporto, where the steamers from England load and discharge, is La Hoz, about four miles to the west with a service of trains and trams into the city. Ovar This town being the nearest eclipse center to England may be expected to draw many travelers in 1900. Being only 22 miles or one and a half hours from Oporto, a day trip may be made thither from Oporto, and this will suit the convenience of those who prefer for lodgings a large city to a small provincial town. A train from Oporto at 7 a.m. returning at 7.45 p.m. will suffice for the requirements of all who will go armed only with small instruments. Pampeloza Junction. Good Hotel. 
Within ten miles to the northeast of this station is the first of the special sites which can be seen in connection with the oporto Lisbon Railway. Take the train from Pampiloza to Luzo, six miles, omnibus thence, a half hour, to Busaco, good hotel, and see the battlefield, the site of one of Wellington's least successful victories. The panoramic views in all directions are superb. The famous convent is now a government school of forestry. After seeing Busaco, progress may be made to Figueria de Foz, 38 miles from Luzo, good hotel, where the tourist may pass the night unless he prefers to stay at Pampiloza. Figueria is a seaside bathing place of repute on a branch line. Leria, population 3,000, Novo Hotel. Stay here two nights in order to have the whole of the intervening day available for a circular tour by road to the Dominican Monastery at Batala, seven miles, and to the Cistercian Monastery at Alcabaca, thirteen miles from Batala and also thirteen miles from Leria. The Batala Monastery, built 1388 to 1515, is by common consent the finest piece of architecture in Portugal. The Alcabaca Monastery, the largest in the world, is of earlier date, 1148 to 1212. The church, 360 feet long, is the most interesting example of early Christian art in Portugal, whilst the cloisters are reputed to be amongst the finest in Europe. Refreshments must be taken by the traveller, for none can be procured during the drive. Ollado is really the nearest station to Alcabaca, three miles, but there is no sleeping accommodation there. Lisbon, population 250,000, hotels Braganza, Avenida, and some adjoining the railway station, owing to its great length from east to west and narrow breadth from north to south, is a less easy city to find one's way in than many other cities. This difficulty is aggravated by the want of leading thoroughfares and an efficient system of street naming and numbering. The sites are the usual ones of every large continental city, such as churches, museums, and picture galleries. For example, the Church of San Roque, the Church of San Finzini with its remarkable royal mortuary chapel, the church and convent at Belem, and the gardens of the Escola Politecnica. But a day should certainly be set apart for a trip to Sintra, 17 miles by rail, trains about every hour. The town, population 5,000, Hotel, Lawrence's, is 1,800 feet above the sea. See the royal or Moorish palace in the town, the beautiful Peña Palace and grounds, and the gardens of Sir F. Cook at Via Montserrat, three miles. These last are open daily to visitors who write their names at the entrance lodge. About 15 miles from Sintra is Mafra, with a palace, convent, and church of wonderful magnificence. An eclipse excursionist, planning a timetable for sightseeing between Oporto and Lisbon inclusive, and with the intention of returning to England from Lisbon, must remember that the Royal Mail Company's boats only sail fortnightly on Tuesdays or Wednesdays from Lisbon. The boats anchor in the river and are reached by a steam tender. Oporto to Paris this route for getting from or to possible eclipse stations in northern Spain or Portugal is set out on the supposition that a certain number of eclipse excursionists may wish to combine the Paris exhibition with the eclipse. There is an international express from Oporto and Lisbon every Tuesday and Friday, which does the journey to Paris in 40 hours, but no one traveling for pleasure would use this train, especially as much of the best scenery is traversed by night. The journey should therefore be performed in sections which may be made up as follows. Oporto to Salamanca via Pamploza, 269 miles, Salamanca to Burgos, 150 miles, Burgos to Biarritz, 186 miles, Biarritz to Paris, 493 miles. Use should be made as far as possible of the International Express. Where this is not done and ordinary trains have to be taken, the delays are interminable and the combinations most exasperating to an Englishman. The hotel accommodation in all the smaller towns of Spain is so universally bad that it is not easy to suggest what otherwise would seem obvious, namely, how best to subdivide at any rate the first three of the above sections. The International Express has a connection with Lisbon, the main train being made up or divided as the case may be at Pampiloza Junction. 
Lisbon to Talavera and Madrid. Observers who think they will be able to do better as regards a clear sky inland in Spain than near either the coast of Portugal or that of Spain will still find in many cases that Lisbon is their most convenient port for landing. The chief stations on this route are Intracomento Junction, 67 miles, Marvau, 149 miles, Valencia de Alcantara, 159 miles, Placentia, 256 miles, Naval Moral, 287 miles, Talavera de la Reina, 328 miles, Madrid de Lichias Station, 412 miles. The places marked are all within the shadow track of the eclipse. Entrocamento, Good Buffet, is the junction station for the lines north to Oporto and southeast to Badajoz, and most trains wait here, eight miles beyond. The Tagus is crossed by a fine bridge commanding good views. Marval, Custom House, is the last station in Portugal, but, but the actual frontier is six miles further on. Valencia de Alcantara, Custom House, is the first station in Spain. During the next 50 miles, the railway passes through much wild mountain scenery. Placentia, Naval Morale, and Talavera as eclipse stations have been mentioned on a previous page. Many celebrated struggles during the Peninsular War took place in this part of Spain, notably at Talavera in 1809 and at Almaraz in 1812. Madrid, population 470,000, Hotel de Paris, Hotel de la Paix. Gibraltar to Madrid with excursions on the way to Granada and Seville. From Algeciras, opposite Gibraltar, there runs every Wednesday an international express train to Madrid and Paris. The Eclipse Central Line crosses this route about 15 miles south of Alcazar to San Juan Junction. Population 8400, Good Buffet, Hotel Casa Briseño, which is 368 miles north of Algeciras and 93 miles south of Madrid. The chief stations between Algeciras and Madrid are Babadilla Junction, 110 miles, Cordova, 185 miles, Alcazar de San Juan, 369 miles, Aranjuez, 430 miles, and Madrid, 461 miles. Babadilla is a double junction. A line runs thence east to Granada, 75 miles, and west to Seville, 104 miles. A traveller visiting Granada must return to Babadilla to get to Seville, but from Seville he can rejoin the main line at Cordova, 75 miles north of Babadilla, and avoid Babadilla. From Seville to Cordova is 81 miles. Algeciras is reached from Gibraltar by a local steamer. About one hour is allowed to make the connection with the train. Eclipse travellers going to this part of Spain who wish to take advantage of their proximity to Granada and Seville will find the following timetable usefully suggestive. May 16th, Wednesday, Gibraltar to Granada, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. May 17th, Thursday at Granada. May 18th, Friday at Granada. May 19th, Saturday, Granada to Seville, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. May 20th, Sunday at Seville. May 21st, Monday at Seville. May 22nd, Tuesday, Seville to Cordova, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. May 23rd, Wednesday at Cordova. May 24th, Thursday, Cordova to Alcazar, 2 a.m. to 3 p.m. May 25th, Friday at Alcazar. May 26th, Saturday at Alcazar. May 27th, Sunday at Alcazar. May 28th, Monday, Eclipse Day. Corresponding to the above international train, there is an express from Paris on Monday reaching Algeciras on Wednesdays. This, of course, might suit the convenience of eclipse travelers proposing to go to Spain via France, and perhaps return via Gibraltar. The time occupied by the international train between Paris and Algeciras and vice versa is about 49 hours. London to Alicante the central line of the eclipse quits Spain at Cape Santa Pola, about 10 miles south of Alicante, population 40,000. It crosses the line of the Alicante and Madrid Railway at Novelda, population 8,000, a station about 20 miles inland from Alicante. Alicante may be reached from England as follows. 1. All sea via Gibraltar and Malaga. 2. All land via Paris, via Ritz and Madrid, 1,077 miles or Paris, Lyon, and Perpignan, 
1,126 miles, or three, part land and part sea via Paris and Marseille, and thence by steamer to Barcelona and Valencia. As regards the two land routes, there is not very much to choose, except that the Biarritz-Madrid route is somewhat shorter and much quicker than the Perpignan-Barcelona route. As regards the two sea routes, both are probably bad from the standpoint of comfort, the steamers in which the voyage would have to be completed being Spanish coasting vessels, but it is difficult to obtain particulars of them in England. The following are some of the chief places between Paris and Alicante on the Perpignan route. Dijon, 195 miles, Lyon, 318 miles, Avignon, 461 miles, Nîmes, 460 miles, Perpignan, 623 miles, Spanish frontier at Port Beau, 650 miles, Barcelona, 758 miles, Tarragona, 825 miles, Valencia, 997 miles, Alicante, 1126 miles. The journey from Paris to Barcelona is accomplished in 23 hours by the International Express. The remaining 368 miles take 27 hours owing to the bad connections of the trains. Madrid is 285 miles from Alicante, the journey occupying about 29 hours. Useful Books for Portugal and Spain As the result of much inquiry and research, the following may be suggested. Guidebooks Handbook for Spain, two volumes, 20 shillings, J. Murray. Handbook to Spain and Portugal, Dr. Charnock, 7 shillings, 6 pence, W. J. Adams. Guide to Spain and Portugal, O'Shea and Lomas, 15 shillings, A. and C. Black. Handbook for Portugal, 12 shillings, J. Murray. Dictionaries, Yasky, R. English-Spanish Conversation Dictionary, 3 shillings, 6 pence, Nut. Castro de Lafayette, Novo Diccionario Inglés Portuguese, 2 volumes, 6 shillings. Grammars and Phrase Books, Dorsey, Rev. A.J.D., Colloquial Portuguese, 3 shillings, 6 pence, Keegan Paul. Wall, C.H., Practical Portuguese Grammar, 7 shillings, Nut. Thim, C.A., Spanish self-taught, one shilling, six pence, Marlborough. Spanish conversation book, one shilling, Walter Scott. Hugo, Spanish simplified, two parts and key, one shilling, six pence, one A Paternoster Row. Various. Chambers, G.F., The Tourist Pocket Book, vocabulary of sixteen languages, one shilling, Philip. Thim, C.A., Spanish washing lists for both sexes, sixpence, Marlboro. End of Appendix. Recording by Philip Gould. End of The Story of Eclipses by George Chambers.